To God be the glory, my brothers and sisters. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you and welcome you back to our Bible study. My name is Clarence, and I'm pastor of United Body of Christ Church, and we definitely give honor to God for us even being here. He should be the head of our lives. Amen. This Lord Jesus Christ, his son, if it wasn't for sweet Jesus Christ uh, transferring his sins to the cross, we would still be charged with them today. Uh, we would be hell bound. So we honor the father and the son for the sacrifice for giving us the gift of eternal life. We bless them in, in Jesus name. Once again, folks, we'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you and welcome you back to our Bible study. Uh, today, we'll be going forth in the uh, sixth chapter of Romans, and, and I always say quite possibly the seventh chapter. A lot of times I, I plan on you know, going forth in these chapters, but, um, you know, however, there, there may be uh, a lot of elaboration in one chapter, which takes time away from the next. Nevertheless, it's our plan to go forth in two chapters of the book of Romans today. Uh, those of you that don't have Bibles, uh, we've got you covered. If you don't have a Bible, we've got you covered. You want to go to our website, www.ubcchurch.org. Once you get to our website, look at the top and you'll see uh, different tabs there. One of the tabs will be online Bible. Click on the online Bible. That'll bring you up to a page that has like a, a box in the center of the page. You should, uh, I was going to say you should see it on the screen. However, uh, nevertheless, once you see that box in the center of the page, click inside that box. It's going to drop down a menu. Uh, once it drops down a menu, you'll look for uh, Romans and then you want to select the sixth chapter. That way... You'll be able to follow us verse per verse, and this is necessary to be able to follow us verse per verse because, first of all, you want to test the spirit. And the way I say we test the spirit is you follow me to make sure that I'm not coming at you, you know, with something crazy, you know, that, that I'm teaching actually what the word says, okay? A lot of times I'll uh, try to relate the word uh, to modern day circumstances, but nevertheless, it shouldn't be taken out of context. And the only way you'll know if it's taken out of context is if uh, the scripture says otherwise. So it's important that you do follow us. Amen. Uh, those of you that, that require prayer, uh, folks, God is awesome. If you want to see change, if you want to see persistence, um, if you want to see strength, if you want to see long suffering, patience, if you want to see God, you want to make sure that you're spending time talking to him. You want to make sure that you're seeking his face. You want to make sure that you're seeking uh, of the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness. And you do that by entering into the prayer closet so that whatever God gives to you, that, that prayer and the meditation of his words will um, solidify it becomes seed that's sown in the heart so the enemy can't come and just rip it from you amen you want to make sure all of this starts with the prayer life you pick up the phone and talk to your family you pick up the phone and talk to your friends God wants you to go and talk to him amen once y'all start conversing back and forth uh, you'll begin to see things in your life the, as they come up you begin to handle them differently, amen? But all that starts with the prayer life, amen? And and so here's where we come in. At. There's going to be some things to, to prove you. There's going to be some things that's going to test you, uh, you know, to see how close you're walking with God, to see if you're going to faint at the first sign of trouble. Will you give up? Uh, will you hold on? Uh, will you praise him? during the time of attack um, will you lift them up when so many things are trying to put you down your prayer your prayer life dictates how you handle those situations as they come at you because uh, no one uh, is is exempt from being tried from being proved amen uh, we come in because at least uh, you when things come at you the magnitude of the things can be great uh, they, they, it seems like them things are just more than what you can bear at times. It seems that way, 
but we are to pray ye one for another. So if you folks go to our website and click on that prayer request tab, it'll take you to a page. With on that, within that page, you have an opportunity to put your uh, your name, your email address, and then the reasons or, or the petition that you're seeking from God. My wife and I will read through that and we'll take it to the Lord in prayer. We pray with you. It, it helps when you actually have a prayer, a prayer life so that we can pray with you and pray for you. It helps. The more you have praying with you, I believe the more power is rendered. Amen. Um, so we said all I have to say, make sure you have a prayer life. This is a praying ministry. We definitely, uh, God, God is familiar with us because we pray, we talk to him. Amen. He shouldn't be familiar with you too. Uh, last but not least, I, I want to talk to you real quick before we get into the Bible study. Uh, folks, if you haven't already check out our, our faith challenges, um, I bless God for the wife that I have. Uh, she loves, she loves God. She loves his people. Uh, she loves working, uh, for God and God converses with her, uh, lets her know what different faith challenges, uh, you know, that, that, uh, wants to see happen here. Um, and faith challenges, if you go to our website, click on the faith challenge tab, uh, that it just bring up a 10 minute videos. If that, uh, of my wife with different exercises, exercises like if you know you have a note with your brother or your sister and you haven't resolved that yet, uh, it, it it's a challenge to you. She may challenge you within that exercise to go and resolve that issue with your brother or your sister. Amen. So that's what it's all about, allowing us to become more kingdom minded. Amen. So if you haven't already done so, check that out. It's there for you. Uh, and all these things are, are tools for us. The Bible studies, uh, the prayer request, uh, the faith challenges. These are all tools to help cultivate and to, uh, to help us mature, uh, you know, as far as the kingdom of God goes. Now, as far as the Bible study, I've already prayed over it. I believe the table is set. I believe the Bible study being a meal. And I believe that it was prepared by God. Amen. Um, Jesus Christ, I believe, brought it out, this being his word, this being his bread, uh, prayed over it. We're ready to dispense it. Amen. Again, we're going to Romans 6 chapter with verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace abound? God forbid. Now, if you look at chapter 5, because this question actually refers to what was the context that was that came to light in chapter five, chapter five talks about how even within our sin, it, it almost seems like the more we sin, the more grace, uh, uh God begins to cover us with, um, um, you know, and, and, and what it, what it is for, it's just for correction. Um, if, if you haven't, and I don't want to review chapter five, <laughs> amen. So if you haven't already seen that, you, if you, you want to go and get that video, powerful lesson. But so chapter six asks the question uh, that chapter five was working up to. If the grace of God covers us in the midst of our sin, if it takes our sin for God to implement grace, should we continue to sin that we can't? Keep being the recipient of grace. Amen. This is what the scripture is asking. Verse 2 ends up saying, God forbid, or so, most certainly not. Uh, goes on to say, how, how then, uh, how shall we that are dead in sin or dead to sin live any longer therein? And so it's saying that when Jesus came uh, and because we die in Christ and we are risen in Christ, uh, we were we're no longer alive to sin to where sin becomes our taskmaster to where we're obedient to sin once jesus delivers us uh, uh from sin uh we're dead to the flesh in a sense if you if you want to look at it that way and we are resurrected new creatures which means sin no longer has power or authority over us because we've been uh, delivered by the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is what this is what verse two is saying. How then shall it says, How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? It it doesn't have power over us. We can't live in sin if we've been dead to sin. When we were when we were made when we were alive in this world in a sense, before Christ delivered us, we were alive to sin. 
uh, we were alive to sin, that sin may kill us, if you will. And so sin had power over us, bringing us to the grave, if you will. Uh, however, uh, again, being that Christ Jesus delivered us from sin, we are dead to sin now, which means it, it no longer has uh, uh, dominion over us. It can no longer control us. Verse 3. Now ye not know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Uh, therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so also should we walk in the newness of life. So even as Christ Jesus died and was resurrected, uh, resurrected in a new body. He was, he, even though he died and he was resurrected and ascended up into heaven as the new person, one that has, one that's considered being the first from the dead, such as we are, because we are baptized just like Christ. Our baptism represents the dying of us, symbolic to that of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as through the baptism, the old man dies. The new man is resurrected. And it is why sin has no more dominion over us. Because the old man of us is dead. The things that you used to do, the things that you used to do before you gave your life to Christ, before you were baptized, maybe hanging out on the street corner, um, maybe fraternizing, whatever level of sin you committed and found pleasure in, those things no longer pleasure you. Amen. They no longer pleasure you because you no longer have it, it no longer has power over you because you are a new creature. You are more spirit now than you are flesh. Before you were dictated by the flesh. Now you're more now you're more apt to to uh, uh, walk in the spirit, which is the newness of life, such as Christ Jesus are, Christ, such as Christ Jesus did. He, he once he became once he uh, uh, died and he was resurrected, he was resurrected more spirit. Do you understand what I'm saying? Such is the case with us. This is why death no longer has dominion over us. Uh, so verse five, if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Even in the case now coming up from the water of baptism. And that's not it. When he comes to receive us, we're going to uh, have our glorified bodies and be just as the Lord Jesus Christ. We will be eternal just as he is because we are the body of Christ. So just as the head was baptized and, and, and then came up from the water, such as we are baptized and came up from the water. And just as the head ascended up to the father, so will we. As the body ascends up into heaven, you know, just just like our head did. Do you understand? Because we are the body of Christ. So even as the head goes up, so will the body go up too. Even as the head went down into the water and came up, such is the body doing the same. Uh, verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is free from sin. And it's again, it's talking about sin no longer having power. It's been cut off from us. Now, it's not to say you won't sin anymore. Amen. It's saying that you that sin has no power over you. Before, it was almost like you had no choice because you were born into sin. And so because you were born into sin, you were born into the nature of sin. So you were more flesh than anything. Uh, whatever came to mind, whatever came to heart. It was almost like you didn't have a choice in the matter until you gave your life to Christ Jesus. And that allowed you to become dead to sin. And watch this. Sin made you a slave. But Christ Jesus, his sacrifice sets you free. Amen. So for he that is dead is freed from sin. We are dead to sin and has no more power. We are we are alive, brought into right to the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Uh, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. 
death no more have dominion over him. For in he for in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. No more the he didn't have to keep dying. He only died that one time. Remember, as well, we're going to see in our Bible studies that as we get more and more into the Old Testament, they they were every year they would kill uh, uh, different animals, uh, you know, to to atone for the sins of men. Amen. Uh, different animals will be sacrificed uh, annually, if you will, that that the sins will be atoned for men. But with Christ. It only took one sacrifice. It, his death, it only took once for an everlasting atonement, uh, uh, you know, and such is the case with us. There is no second death with us. We're going to die that one time and that's it a and live forever. Uh, however, there will be those that choose not to give their lives over to Christ and they're going to experience the death that sin will give them, and then they're going to experience what's known as the second death, which is the lake of fire. Amen? Because that, be, and, and here's, here's the thing about it. With us, as we live, as we live forever in the Lord Jesus Christ, as we mimic uh, uh, our Father and His Son, those that have not the Lord Jesus Christ, they mimic their Father, which is the enemy. And so just as the enemy will be tossed into the lake of fire, such will his children, the children of disobedience, be tossed in a lake of fire. They're going to mimic their they're going to mimic their father, the works of their father, which is the enemy. And just like sin will be tossed into the lake of fire, sin will take its slaves with them to the lake of fire. His slaves being the children of disobedience. Amen. Uh, verse 11. Likewise. Reckon ye also yourselves, or consider ye also yourselves uh, to be dead unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Again, it's the way you, it's the way your mindset is changed. Before, you couldn't help but do that. I can't help but do this. I can't help but I'm going to always do this. I'm going to always be this way. I'm going to always be that way. But once you give your life over to Christ, you're not that same man. You're not that same person. You are, you are a new. You are a new creature in Christ through Jesus Christ because Jesus, Jesus became a new. When he, was bat, when he was baptized and brought up and the, the spirit descended on him like a dove, well, when Jesus was put into the earth, when he was killed, and he was resurrected. He was resurrected as a as a new one. Do you understand? And and because that was of him, because we are through the Lord Jesus Christ, the same thing happens to us. Right now, we sin has no power over us. And then the time is going to come uh, where we will have power over the world, just like the Lord Jesus Christ does. All this made possible through the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior. That's why it is so important to embrace him. Uh, when you see people robbing banks, when you see the, the when you see hate and animosity, when you see greed, even corporate greed at its highest, that's because they have not the Lord Jesus Christ. The thing about it is we can't be surprised at the level of of sin that we see happening daily. Whether it's uh, uh, whether people are stealing, um, whether the love of many waxing cold, uh, backbiting, we can't be surprised at the at the magnitude of sin uh, uh, that we see daily, because sin has no limits. Do you understand what I'm saying? It, sin is like cancer; it 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 seeks to kill, steal, kill, and destroy. It has no limit. It grows. It grows. Its appetite cannot be satisfied. Amen. It's always trying new and different things. It's always trying to see how dark it can get through you if you let it. It's always looking to have power to subdue you and make you a slave so that you can do the bidding of sin. Your skin is sensitive to sin. Your flesh is sensitive to 
to sin. And if you don't break away, if you don't allow Jesus Christ to give to free you from sin, you will die in your sins. Because ultimately, that's what sin is seeking to do. It is to kill you through subduction. Amen. It wants to subdue you. It wants to seduce you. And it wants to seduce you to death. Amen. That's why it's in, and and it's a for some people it's a very slow, drawn out, methodical process. To other people, it's <laughs> just instantaneous death. Amen. So it's important to embrace Jesus because once we embrace Jesus, we walk by faith, which means we walk by the, we walk by the Spirit. We don't walk by sight, which means we don't live by the flesh. We live according to the spirit and according to the spirit of our Lord living within the, within inside of us. Um, and watch this, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and this is what God did to us. He quickened us, brought us from the dead through Jesus, gave us life. Amen. Uh, verse 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies that you shall obey it in the lust thereof. Now, here's another thing about sin. It's not to say that as you've been freed from sin, one thing about light, light wants to light wants to dim. Um, sin wants to dim light. Amen. It wants because sin uh sin likes to work in the midst of darkness. And if there is light being manifested, Sin is not at liberty to do what it wants to do because the works and the deeds of sin is done in dark, if you will. Amen. So when sin sees light or an element of light such as ourselves, the one thing it tries to do is appeal to the sin that our spirits wear. Amen. We wear this. Even though we are free from sin, which means it no longer has control over us, sin is trying to put out our light. It's trying to bring us back to the dark side. And so what it's trying to do, because we have memory of where we come from, it's trying to appeal to the memory of your former man, of who you were, who you used to be. It'll bring up old friends of yours. Facebook, watch out. It'll bring up people you used to date in school. And see, because when you become a new creature, you got to follow this thing all the way through. If you a new man, you should have a new address. You should have new people that you hang around with. You shouldn't have the old things that leads to pathways back to an old life. You shouldn't, the telephone number that you had, you know, before you were saved, and you had so many women, the, the fellas I'm talking to, you had so many women that had this number. Once you became saved, that number got to go. Otherwise, you're given an opportunity for sin to reign in your mortal bodies. Because I guarantee you, it wants the, the sin wants to put your lights out. It wants to put your light out and bring you back to the dark side. And you will help it to do so if... If you don't make the changes in your life to condition and position yourself away from those former things that was killing you, amen? If you got, uh, you still hanging around, God delivered you from alcohol and drugs and you still hanging around the people that used to get you high. That's you, you will, you will allow sin to regain control of you. You don't want to have that done. This is why the man of God is saying, let not sin a ring or have control of your mortal bodies. Amen. Because once it subdue you, just like how God quickened us and brought us to life from dead, sin wants to re-kill you. It wants to take you back out. Amen. It wants to destroy you. And it's going to do that through familiar faces. It will entice you because you remember where you came from. If you remember where you came from, you remember how good it felt when you were caught up in some stuff. See, the only way you feel bad is through the Holy Ghost. You feel guilty about what you did. But during the time that you was doing it, sin enticed you to feel good about it. Amen. I'm just being real. I'm being real now. Come on. So the Holy Ghost 
convicts you to make you feel real bad about having done what you've done. So let don't so in order to keep sin from reigning for controlling, having control of your mortal bodies, cut the stuff off that that cut them people out, cut the numbers out. Your hangout spots, you can't say, I just gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ and I'm living for Jesus and you're still hanging out at the strip clubs because you don't want to say no. You know, and you're trying to call it a project. Well, I'm going to go into the strip club and I'm a minister uh, uh, to the folk at the strip club. <laughs> Who are you kidding? Who are you kidding? You know, if you want to minister to them folks, you wait till they get on off of work with some clothes on. <laughs> and, and getting away from, from the playground and then talk to them. Amen. Anyway, let me go on with that. I don't want to take too much time here. But let me reread that so we have an understanding here. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Amen. Uh, neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members are instrument of righteousness unto God. We just got done talking about that. Don't be deceived and think that you're doing God's work. In the midst of that, God is not going to tempt you with sin. He ain't going to send you into no strip club when you got naked women up in there and say, I need you to go minister to that naked woman on the stage. It don't work like that. He's not going to tempt you with sin. He will wait. He will have a way for you to meet with that person when they have their clothes on and you have you some backup. But you think that you're going to go minister to somebody like you're doing a good job. But all along, all you're doing is answering to the call of sin. And you're becoming a vessel. And one thing about sin, sin wants to make a mockery out of those things that have been redeemed. It's looking, it's for some reason, it's it's more, it's more of a flavor. Let me go, let me, you know what? Go with me real quick to Job. Go with me real quick to Job here. Let me show you something. I, I you know, I ain't even planning on going here. But I want to show you something in Job here. Hold your places there. Uh, let's see here. You remember when 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 uh, Satan came and uh, came over to Job? You remember when Satan presented himself to God? Well, we're about to see this right now. Watch this. Um, Job. First chapter, verse six. Now there was a day when the sons of God, and it's talking about the angels, came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect man, an upright man? Now notice that the, the, the character description of Job. A perfect man, an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. He's a righteous man. Now watch this. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Do a Job fear God for not for nothing? God is has thou not made a hedge about him? And about his house and about all that he has on every side, thou hast blessed the works of his hands and the substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he has and leave a curse to thy face. So because Satan was able to, to, to say, well, God was like, I know you looking for somebody to devour. You haven't looked at my son Job, have you? You haven't looked at my soul, my son Job, have you? Because my, my guy is righteous. He cannot be moved. Satan basically was saying, yes, I have. As a matter of fact, I can't even do nothing to him because you got a hedge of protection around him. You blessed this man with this and you blessed him with that. I can't do nothing with him. Now, where, where am I going with all this? Satan knows who stands for God and he wants to try you. You know why? Because he's got his eye. If he's not looking at the people that are, are that he's already killing, they're already got. His eyes is on those that stand for God. 
He wants to bring you down. You are the prize. Amen. He wants to damn you. You are the prize. And he's not going to come at you and attack you. He's going to come to deceive you so that he can use you as an instrument, as a vessel. Just like God wants to use you for his will, his will equates to righteousness. The enemy wants to use you for his will. His will equates to unrighteousness, disobedience, sin. He wants to, he wants to be able to say, I'm using a child of God and made him my servant. Amen. He wants to become your master. He, he's not looking for those that are unsaved. They're killing themselves. He's looking for those that are saved so that he can use them to continue to bring down others that are saved. So that you should get, have an understanding of, of verse 13. Neither, neither yield your members as instruments. Don't give control of yourself over to sin, of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourself unto God. Amen? Uh, as those that are alive from the dead. And, and when it says as those that are alive from the dead, there should be some some jubilee one thing about having having been in sin and dying in sin before the death of sin that sin was killing us slowly daily uh we found ourselves get have been caught up in some major mess but when god pulled you out and he delivered you and saved you and saved you I am so excited about where I am today. I don't even, I'm scared to even be associated with those things uh, that easily uh, beset me then. I'm excited about the love of God. When I hear, <laughs> when I see the word of God being fulfilled, I get excited. Do you understand? So when the scripture says, uh, as those that are alive from the dead, these are people that are that are careful. They're not quick to they're not quick to have their feet run into mischief because they're righteous and God stands with them. They want they want to help God help them to stay righteous. Do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> people that have been brought from the dead, they are excited and they ain't trying to die again. They are ever so careful. They ain't, they ain't gonna answer the phone if they know somebody. If somebody got their number and they try, they ain't even trying to hook up with that person. These people are careful because they know what it's like to be caught up in mess and and being afraid to die in your sin. Amen. So there should be this gratitude. Your attitude should reflect gratitude. These are people that have been brought back from the death, and you're looking from the dead of sin. You're looking. To, to to make to you don't want God uh, to be discouraged and to second guess having ever redeemed you from sin. You're going to be at your best for him. Amen. Anyway, going on to verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but you're under grace. You don't the law. It we don't you you know what? You could you can look at the scriptures and be like, okay, I'm not going. I'm not going to kill. I'm not going to steal. That's not going to be me. But your heart can be still full of mischief, amen. And see, with the law comes the wrath of God. And and so it's like if you break one of those laws, you still endure the wrath of God. So that's the problem with being under the law. You you walk kind of religiously, but you still don't have. You still don't have the love of God in you. You just have obedience, but not the love. Amen. Not the spirit of God. But being under grace, it's like I don't need to know that it's wrong to look at my neighbor's wife. I don't need to know these things. I got the spirit of God in me. And if something should happen that I mess up, the wrath of God is not the first thing on the list to come at me. Amen. Now God will chastise those that He loved, no different than that what He did that that He does with the kids, but be but no different than what we should be doing with our children. We should chastise them as we love them. But if you take your hands off and just let them, you know, hurt themselves and hurt others, you know. Now I don't want to get sidetracked. 
understanding what the scripture says is in, in verse 14, sin shall not have dominion over you for you are not under the law, but under grace. Here's the problem with the law. The law reveals the sin that's in you. The law, uh, uh, the law gives you knowledge of what the sin is and how to, how to complete the sin. Thou should not cover thy neighbor's wife. Hmm. What is it to cover thy neighbor's wife? You look it up and be like, nah, I ain't going to do that. And then you st all of a sudden, because somebody mentioned it to you, now you're looking at your neighbor's wife. The law reveals uh, what, you know, the law reveals what sin is. It gives you knowledge of being disobedient against God because the law was nothing but things not to do against God. Once you come into the knowledge of being disobedient against God, <laughs> that's a problem. But grace is different. We're under grace. We have the spirit. So if something happened that we do mess up, we're not judged and recipients of the wrath of God because we're found in violation of the law. We haven't violated the law uh, once you come into grace. If you mess up, then you have the Lord Jesus Christ to atone for your mess up. Do you understand? But that don't mean that we wake up this day and say, I could go do whatever I want because I'm under the grace of God. No, now you just let sin <laughs> reign in your mortal body because that, that's premeditated. Now that's a sure sign that sin is reigning in your mortal bodies. Amen. But when there is grace and because we have been made alive from the dead, we our thought processes are different. We don't think like that. If anything, what can I do to please God this day? Where would God have me to go and what would he have me to say? And folks, I'm not being cliche. This is the way that your lives ought to be. How can I be an instrument and a vessel to God? Because I want God to be glorified through me. I want him to be magnified through me. This should be your daily goal, not about you. Because if you start making things about you, then you will give place for sin to, to ring in your mortal body. But when it's about the spirit, then it's about God. Verse 15, what then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? Certainly not. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourself servant to obey, his servant ye are to whom ye obey, whether it's sin unto death or unto the or obedience unto, one, uh, to, unto righteousness. And that's what we just got done talking about. Once you start... Even though God, even though sweet Jesus Christ uh, had delivered you, uh, you know, from, from the power of sin, once you yield yourself back over to that mindset, then you are allowing the, the sin to, to reestablish a connection with your mortal body. Do you understand? And it's not long before you start doing those things that you used to do. And you have to be watchful, man. You have to be diligent. I don't care if you just, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to give an example. Say God delivered you um, from, from pornography. If you pick up a remote, if you know that having HBO, Cinemax, Showtime, or, or whatever the other movie channels are, if you know that at nighttime, they're going to have certain programming on TV. Maybe it's not a good idea to not only not watch that stuff, but to just cut that, just cut out the service period. Because if you start watching that channel, though those channels, even in the daytime, they're going to start giving you a sneak peek of some stuff that's going to be coming on at nighttime. And what's going to happen is your, your flesh is going to rise up because it's been deprived because you got a righteous life. Your flesh is hungry. And this it wants to get back into cahoots with sin so that it can grow stronger. So the moment that you begin to watch these little video clips of, of, of you know what's going to, even though you're not going to watch what's coming on at nighttime, if you begin to watch their previews, it won't be long before you begin to covet and desire what they're going to be showing in the night. And every time you yield a little bit, then every time you give up a little bit of yourself to see what's going on in those things that are unrighteous, you are giving up more control over your, of yourself. Every decision that you make against God is giving more and more power and control to sin. And before you know it, 
If you begin to establish a pattern of disobedience, then you have fully become a servant of sin again. Sin has brought you back to life in itself so that it can kill you again. It has revived you to take you back out. Do you understand what I'm saying? So in this case, do you understand what the, what the scriptures are saying? Not what I'm saying, but what the scripture is saying. So you don't want to yield control. And remember, sin don't take all of you just like this. It begins to take parts of you, parts of you, and parts of you. And the more of you it has, the more of you that it has, that part that it has of you is going to work in cahoots to get the rest of you. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Oh, well, that wasn't so bad, man. I shouldn't have watched that, but you know, well, I know God will forgive me. But then the next day, and now you know what day and time that particular program and come back on. So you said, well, I'm not going to watch the next episode, you know, <laughs> before you know it, something happens to where you make it, you make it a point to, to try to catch their preview of what it is that they're going to be showing that's, that's, that's unholy on that TV and you call up again. And you call up again. And before you know it, you've given all of yourself. And before you know it, it doesn't stop there. It's going to use you as an instrument, as a vessel. When you think of an instrument, you could think of any kind of instrument. If you think of tools to carve, then you're trying to scope a masterpiece. You're trying to be, be a masterpiece. If you're thinking about instruments to play, then you're trying to create a symphony. It's always trying to create something with you. So if you yield yourself as an instrument and a vessel to sin, it's going to try to create something through you, something that's going to bring you towards the death and also attract somebody else to it. Amen. Uh, going on with this, and, and, and folks, I really hope to, to get through chapter 7. Um, but God be thanked uh, that you were servants of sin but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. I'm moved now because of things that I've been through in my life. But you can't help but thank God because no matter how bad you were, no matter how close to death you were, God opened up your heart and allow this gospel to, to penetrate your heart. And it was the only source of light within you. Everything else was totally dark. But he cleaned up a little part so that he could bring in this light. And that light began to radiate and permeate and get you clean. Amen. Which is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You took a bloodbath through Jesus Christ so that you can be redeemed. And that is, and God is worthy to be thanked. Folks, you ought to take time right now to tell him, thank you, God. Thank you, because when I reflect on the mess that I was in, I knew where I was headed. And you saw and delivered me from the bonds and the chains of sin. Sin had, had a reservation. Sin plotted the grave and had a little spot laid out for me. So, so, cause they knew it was going to kill me. Man. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine from which you were delivered. Being then made from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of the flesh. For as you have yielded your members, uh, servants, to, unrighteous, to uncleanness and to iniquity, unto iniquity, even so now your members being servants to righteousness unto holiness. So just as you were all in to sin, once you are, del once you are delivered and redeemed, the, you should be all in to righteousness. In sin, we know <laughs> when you think about dance clubs, you know every dance because you were all into it. With drinks, you knew every drink. With cigarettes, you knew how to go there and ask for cigarettes. Give me some 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 new Paul new Newport 
uh, one hundreds uh, uh, filtered or whatever. You knew exactly the language. You knew everything there was to know about whatever sin there was. Amen. Uh, um, they got this book, uh, um, uh, 50, 50 shades of Fifty Shades of Gray or something like that. And you got people. You got people that know all these. Uh, 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 different things, different components of uh, whatever, whatever sexual uh, 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 immoralities they may be selling uh, uh, in, in that particular book or, or with that particular lifestyle, you know the language. You know, you know everything there is to know about that because you were all in. Do you understand what I'm saying? You were all in. Um, for as you have yielded your members, servants, uh, to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity. Even so, yield your members to, to the servants uh, of righteousness and, and unto holiness. When you were all in, you knew every cuss word, every movie. Uh, um, you knew how to cheat. You knew how to lie. You knew how to steal. You the, There's one thing about sin. Sin makes you a professional sinner. Amen. Sin makes you a professional sinner to where you can teach the trade and become good at it. Well, the scripture is saying this, just as you were that devoted to sin and to death, so should you be committed and devoted to uh, righteousness and holiness. Amen. Just as you were <laughs> committed to lying, having women, women each day of the week, um, uh, uh, women having men for each day of the week. You knew how to get money from one man and then time from another man, uh, consultation from one man. Uh, you, you, just as you became a professional in what you were doing, such should be the case on the righteousness side of things. For when you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. Oh, man. There was no expectation of you to be good when you were in the midst of sin. People that don't, people, <laughs> people that enter in the strip clubs or, or people that go out to nightclub uh, clubs and those clubs at five, three, four o'clock in the morning, you don't expect them to go to church. You don't expect them to not cuss when you're around them, to not look at women as they go by and check them out. You don't expect them to not steal. As a matter of fact, a person that you don't, a person that's drinking and full of alcohol and whatever, you're afraid to get in the elevator with them. The expectation from them is not to bless you. <laughs> Do you understand? You don't expect to sneeze and hear these folks say, God bless you. There is, an ex there is no expectation of righteousness when it comes to a professional sinner, when it comes to a person that is by lifestyle and by trade a sinner. There is no expectation of righteousness in them. You don't want to ask them for nothing because you don't want them to cuss you out. And when you're hungry, don't don't ask them if they can give you a cup of dollars because if they do, it might cost you your life. I'll give you two, but I expect five back. You understand? There is no expectation of righteousness in them. This is why the scripture says, for when you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. You free to die. You free. You don't have to be obedient to God. You don't have to be out here feeding people that are hungry, praising God up in it. You free from all that because God was not your master. The devil was your master. You free to serve him. See, you can, there is an expectation that there is an expectation of people on the dark side. We expect them to do exactly what they do. You can't watch TV now. And, and not see any, not see forms of homosexuality on the screen. The wholesome programming now introduces this. We have the nerve to look surprised, but how could you look? You expected them to have some form of righteousness? We're talking about the world. The world is going to be this way. That's just how it is. You're, and you know why they are expected to be this way? Because God don't hold them to an expectation of righteousness. They were free from righteousness. Amen. Uh, verse 22. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and, and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Mighty, 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 mighty. 
Um, yeah, let's go on with chapter seven because I don't want to, it's a good Bible study, but let me go back up to 22 and 23. But now I'm being made free from sin and become servants to God. You have your fruits unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Just like when we were in servants of sin, we would see men, especially we would see how many women we could get. How try to get the game up, you know. Learning the dance move, learning lies, learning lines, learning rap music, you know, whatever, you know, whatever, you know, whatever we can to help us further whatever our ambitions, whatever our fleshly ambitions were. Um, but now as we serve God, we do things that's going to expand his kingdom. Before we were exp expanding the kingdom of darkness, now we're on this side and taking things that we learn from God and using it to expand his kingdom. That, and, and whatever participation we put into that, according to this righteousness, that yields fruit. Just like we yielded fruit in darkness, we begin to yield fruit in light. Amen. And we end up getting everlasting life because that's the reward of who we are. In death, the, re the, the reward of sin is death. And we're about to see this now. We're about to talk about the reward. Uh, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. The reward of you being accomplished, <laughs> whether <laughs> when you are in the midst of unrighteousness, the reward of you accomplishing that is death. The fullness of sin is death. It says, but the gift of God or the fullness of God based on the reward system from God for you doing what you you doing what he would have you to do. The reward of that is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And all of this is made by you cannot forget Jesus. It, it is because of him that you were delivered from sin. It is because of him that ye are righteous this day. It is because of him that that gave his life. He seen what you was going to be doing. He seen what, what you would do before you ever was. He knew what you would do. And in the midst of that, he still made sure that you would be a recipient of the atonement made possible through his blood. Amen. Bless the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's uh let's try to finish out uh, uh chapter seven here. Know ye not, brethren, for I he said, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. How that the law hath dominion over man as long as he liveth. For the woman which he for the woman which hath the husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the woman be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So it's talking about the law. And and remember, uh, uh, Moses gave us, <laughs> or gave, gave children of Israel, uh, 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 told them to give, you know, the, the woman a bill of divorcement. And of course, right now, uh, 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 Paul is talking about the law as for, uh, the, as for Rome itself, what he's talking about here. But even the Lord Jesus Christ is saying as far as things go, that, that <laughs> you you were never to be separated and divorced from your wife, amen. Uh, husbands and wives, you were not meant to be separated or divorced, amen. The only way that that was to happen was made through death, but there was a law that inspired that. Do you understand? There was a law that said that this should this should not happen, amen. So he begins, so Paul is starting to talk talk about this a little bit. So those of you that, that have been married and divorced, and I got news for you, I have. I've been married and divorced. But you got to understand uh, uh, what grace is about. You got to understand forgiveness. And, and we're, we're, we're going to see this. Watch this. Let me reread uh, verse uh, chapter 7, verse 1 here. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know, that know the law. How that the law uh, hath dominion over man as long as he liveth. For the woman which has a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, uh, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then, 
if while her husband liveth, she marry to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. And it's the law that's dictating how she is looked upon. You see what I'm saying? And, and this is, this is again, for church folk. Because church folk goes by the letter of the law, okay? Um, you, you go by, church folk goes by, well, this is, what the, this is what this says, this is what this says, this is what that. You're not incorporating grace. We all sin. And I'm not sitting over here condoning divorce of, any, of anybody or anything. But I'm saying, as Paul is pointing out, according to the law, if those of you that, that mind and honor the law, the law is saying that she'll be an adulteress long until her husband dies. Once that dude dies, she is no longer considered an adulteress and she can freely remarry. Such was the case with the Roman law. Amen. Such is the case as we look at it today. But let Paul continue here. Wherefore, in verse four, my brother, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. Amen. Uh, that ye should be married to another, even to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bring forth uh, uh, fruits unto him. Amen. And, and, and praise God, because people will come at you and say you should be married. But don't you know that you are considered the bride of Christ? The law has no dominion over you because it, according to the law, sin should be your master because you're going to incur the wrath of God because the law reveals to you, uh, the law reveals to you what sin is. Amen. And the curiosity of sin, you begin to indulge, which means you become a recipient of, of, of the wrath of God. And just like the law says that you shouldn't remarry, but we are not under the law we are under grace so the first bride that we end up coming into the first groom that we come into is the lord jesus christ we, he puts a ring on our finger not according to law but to the grace of god amen and we cannot be called adulterers if we choose jesus over our family jesus teaches us how to be better to our family as a matter of fact our families become our mistress. <laughs> Do you understand? Do you understand what I'm saying? Jesus become your, he becomes your husband and your family become your mistress. Jesus teaches you how to take care of them. Amen. And, and, and the law can't judge this matter. You can't judge this matter because this is the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what he would establish. He is the groom. We are the bride and our family. I know folk don't take issue with what I'm saying. Our family is the mystery, is the mystery. But this, as long as we don't put them first, he doesn't mind us going back and loving them, but he wants us to know where home is. <laughs> Amen. I know people are going to take issue with it, but we're going by what the scriptures say. You take issue with the scripture. He wants to be first. He delivered you. So can't nobody come and say you're breaking the law. Jesus said, what law? There is no law. Going on verse four. Wherefore, my brother, you are also become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who was raised from the dead, that you should bring forth fruits unto God. For when you were in the flesh, uh, the motions of sins, uh, which or uh, or the 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 acts of sins if you will or the passions if you will the desires if you will uh for when you were in the flesh uh the passions of sin which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruits unto death so because law because the law lets you know what sin was and it brought up a curiosity that curiosity translated to a passion within your flesh this is what we've already talked about. And the scriptures is saying that. that. That curiosity brought up a desire within you to know more about what you were not supposed to do. If you tell a kid, uh, if you touch that button, if you touch that button, that's going to break that. So don't touch that button. Oh man, you just let them know what kind of power that button has and what kind of power they got through the button. 
<laughs> so now they want to see just how it's going to break. They wouldn't have never thought nothing about it until you told them what not to touch. Now they want to touch it. Do you understand what I'm saying? And that's what the scriptures is saying how sin was. For when we were in the flesh, uh, the passions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our flesh. They worked in our flesh to get us to bring or to bring forth death. Amen. But now we are delivered from the law that being there wherein we were held, that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So even though we had these commandments, don't do this, don't do that, do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. All we were doing was adhering to the letter. But the problem was, as we were trying to adhere to the letter, we, if we were still curious about what it was to be like to break it, what it, what it would be like to break that stuff, you know, and, and, and unfortunately that, that incurred for us the wrath of God. Those things that God told us not to do, we looked to try to do them because we were in the midst of our flesh. Amen. But now that we're in the spirit, we, it, we don't operate like that. He don't have to tell us what not to do. He gave us a heart to love him, to, to those things. It comes natural to love him and to want to please. We're more focused on doing right and being glad about where we are and not wanting to go back, you know. Verse 7, what should we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. And he's watching, he's not going to call the law sin. He said, God forbid, nay, had I not known sin, but the law. He said, hey, yay, or excuse me, nay, I had not known sin, but the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said thou should not covet. But sin, uh, taking the time by, as it says, taking occasion or taking the opportunity by commandment worked in me all manner of, of concupiscence for without or or concupiscence is, is in, in you can look at it in the sense of of a uh, uh, a desire or, or um uh evil desire if you will uh, so you can say by sin taking the taking the, the opportunity by commandment and and this is what sin did sin used the commandments uh, uh, to bring forth out of us evil desires uh, for without the law, uh, sin was dead. So sin looked at the law and said, we can use that law to bring forth or to work up evil desires in them to make them disobedience because the law is the knowledge of sin. When God told Adam and Eve, don't eat from the tree of this garden, what he did <laughs> was reveal to them uh, 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 the law. And what happened is Eve got to the point that it brought up a desire in her. You know, that's what the law did. It said that's what sin did. Sin, the law was good, but sin used the law to bring forth the evil desires out of us. The law was good. It's the sin that used the law, just as the scripture says here. But sin, taking the opportunity by the commandments, worked in all manner of evil desires, for without the law, the sin was dead. If it had not been for the law, then the sin wouldn't have been empowered. But because the law was there, the sin used the law to empower itself. Amen? For I was alive without the law once, but when commandments came, sin revived and I died. Man, that's heavy. Before I was alive without the law once. But when sin, but, but, but when the commandments came, the sin revived and I died. Without the law, I was good. I mean, without the law, I, I had, you know, you got to think about it. Uh, and I'll go back to, I'll, I'll try to come on up with another sin. Um. Thou should not steal. I would never think about stealing. I wouldn't, you know, say you in the job. Uh, right now, I work a job. I work a job driving a bus, okay? And, and I, you know, we sell tickets and everything else, and sometimes we carry cash. Now, I ain't saying that for you, for, for folk that's, that's up to no good, but I'm, I want to give you an example here. Without the law, I'm good. I don't need nobody to come and tell me 
don't steal on your job. I don't need nobody to tell me that. But all of a sudden, once you put out a memo saying that so-and-so was caught stealing, what they did is they, they did this and they did that in, in order to get some money on the job. We don't condone this. Now that I know that people are stealing and that they were getting away with it before they got caught, now you putting up you putting thoughts in my head that's going to that's going to radiate in my flesh and make me think. Now this sin is going to get me in trouble because if I end up going forth with it, it's going to lead to other darker things. But had I never known nothing about it, I wouldn't have tried to get it in, in the first place. And that's what, that's what Paul is saying here. He said, for I was alive without the law once, but when the commandments came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. Hey, the, the, <laughs> and you got to think about it. Oh, but this is a good Bible study. The law was made to make you live. But when sin took, when sin took the opportunity to use the law, it, the law that was meant to help you live became the very thing that would help kill you because you would be found in disobedience towards God. Oh, man. Verse 11, for sin, uh, taking the opportunity by the commandments, it deceived me. And, and by it, it slew me. It killed me. <laughs> I'm thinking, well, what is the law? What are the laws? What are the commandments of God? Is this and you know you really want to have a, an understanding of the commandments of God. So you start reading what the commandments are. Thou should not kill, thou should not, not steal, thou should not bear false witness. Um, that you know, and once you start understanding these things, all of a sudden the knowledge of killing, the knowledge of stealing, the knowledge of lying, you start looking at these things, and the deception begins to come in because you think you want to learn them. But no, it's not that you want to learn them. It's that sin is, is, is using it to deceive you so that it can use it against you. Amen? That's heavy. So wherefore the law was holy in verse 12 and the commandment holy and just and good. So as you see, it's not the law that was the problem. It's the, it's the occasion or it's the opportunity that sin used within the law to work against us but it, the law was not the problem to begin with but sin knew that it can use the law against us no different than what the serpent did did yay did god say that of, of every tree in the garden thou should not eat of this tree you know and 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 the, the enemy began to talk to eve it began to deceive her through the law God set the law. The enemy came and deceived her. It wasn't the law that was bad. It was the deception that the enemy used the law against her. Amen. Let's go. Oh, we got to go back. We got to this, this. Let's go back and understand what 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 the apostle is saying here. Uh, go with me to Genesis. Um, Let's see here. We want Genesis. Uh, is it the third chapter of Genesis? Yeah, the third chapter of Genesis. Now, the serpent was more subtle. Amen. He was sneaky. Amen. And remember what Paul said, that the law deceived him. Watch this. Then any, it, was, it was the sin deceiving him through the law. He says, that, now the serpent was subtle than any beast of the field, or he was more conniving <laughs> more than any beast of the field. Uh, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, he began to use the law. This is sin using the law. Yea, hath God said, ye should not eat of every tree in the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of every fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die, for God doeth know that in the day you eat thereof, your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And this is what this is what the Apostle Paul is saying. He says, um, and sin, taking the opportunity by the law or by the commandments, it deceived me, and by it caused me to be slewed. Amen. So that's that's a, to get you to understand what's going on. The law was good, but it's 
the sin was able to use the law. Amen. Uh, verse 13, thir verse 13, whether what then that what was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin that it might appear sin work a death in me by that which is good. Uh, that sin by commandment might become exceeding sinful. Amen. So once you once you you say thou should not steal, but you continue to com you com you continue to steal, um, the workings of it it's it's no it, it it's exemplified. The more you do it, the once you do it, you end up continually to do it. Once you once you yield your vessel over to sin. Uh, it begins to take you into other dark matters. Amen. So as it says, but sin that it might appear sin worketh death in me uh, by that which is good. And it's because, and it all started out because I got knowledge of what the law was. So it's using the knowledge of something good and turning it into something bad because it's putting me in violation of that which was good. It says that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful and exceeding sinful the fullness of sin is death so by the commandment once i break the law i'm guilty of breaking all the laws it's going to kill me i'm going to be dead because i'm found in disobedience once i'm in disobedience that's it the judge i'm set up for judgment i'm exceeding sinful i'm a, i'm going all the way to the fullness of sin which is death and it's and it took and it all started from that which was good because I'm found stealing because there was a law that that I got knowledge of that thou should not steal a curiosity of what it was like to steal rose up in me and it led to other things amen for we know that the law was spiritual but I'm carnal sold under sin and carnal you look at carnal is is I'm fleshly if you will I'm I'm flesh when you look at carnal it means operating in the flesh for that which i do i allow not for what i would that i do not but for what i hate that i do so for that which i do i understand not that when you see allow now you can replace it by saying i understand not um for that that i would or that that i want to do that i do not but what i hate that i do when you're under flesh, and he this is a great psalmist here, he's a, he's a poet here. When you are under flesh, you don't, it's bringing you into new areas. And you may be a little scared to get into some areas, but your senses are going off so much that you can't help but try it. But when you are saved, you set up boundaries. You don't go you don't go over into that stuff because you know what it did to you. Remember, you are saved with memory of where you came from. But when you were carnal, watch this. For what I do, it said for that which I allow, or that for that which I, I do not understand, it's that that I do. But that that I hate, I he goes on to say <laughs> let me let me repeat this. Let me read this so I make sure I explain it right to you. For that which I do. I allow not, okay, that I, I allow not, or that I under, he, basically he's saying that which I do, I understand, uh, because he's allowing it not, if he allow it not, that means he has an understanding of what he's not going to allow, for that that I, that I want to do, that I do not, but what I hate, that I do, so that that I want to do, that I do not, but those things that I hate, that I do. Now, let me read this next verse here. For then if I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it's good. Once again, if, I, if, if then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that is good. Or I'm, I'm demonstrating to the law that is good. Amen. Now then, it's no more I that do it, but the sin that dwelleth in me. Uh, so one, let me read 16 again. For then if I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that is good. And so what 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 he's saying ultimately between 15 and 16, those things that he sh those things that that uh, he end up having an understanding for, 
uh, and the law is telling him what he shouldn't do, that he begins to do because he's got an understanding of. Uh, and those things that he don't that he don't want to, those things that he is made up to hate to do, he ends up doing it. And he goes on to say here in verse 16, but if I go in and do those things, then I'm actually showing the law that me consenting unto those things is that is good. So I'm a recipient of the judgment of God because of me consistently doing those things that the law is telling me not to do. I have an understanding of it because as I go into this thing, the law is saying don't steal. I know what it is to not steal. And for some reason, here I am doing it. That's why he's saying for that which I do not. He said for that which I do, I allow not. And he that that means you come into the understanding. He does you once you come into the understanding of it, you don't want to have it do it. You don't want to do it. If you come into the understanding of what it is to break these laws, you, and I don't want to confuse you folks. I, I'm just trying to break down what the man is saying here. <laughs> and he's he's taking a poetic way to say it. But ultimately, between verses 15 and 16, ultimately what he's saying is. Those things that you have an understanding for, that you know not to do, uh, ultimately, you're going to want to do them when you're under sin. Even though you're not supposed to be doing these things, once you find out what it is you're not supposed to be doing, you're going to have a desire to do those things because you're carnal. You're under flesh. You're not saved. You're carnal. And when you're carnal, carnal knows what it's not supposed to do. It needs to know what it's not supposed to do so it knows what to do. <laughs> do you understand? Sin is always looking to top itself. Sin needs to know what new rules it can break. It needs to know what it's not supposed to do so that it can go and do those things. And he's saying those things that I hate are the very things that I do. And he said, now then it is no more I, but the sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. I have a desire to do good, but because I'm walking through the flesh or I'm living by the flesh, people have a desire to be right, but their judgment is always clouded because they think through their flesh and not through their spirit. It says, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Man, this is heavy. And how to perform that which is right, I find not. And it's crazy. When you're born, nobody teaches you how to be good. I, 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 excuse me. You got to be taught how to be good when you're born. But nobody need to teach you how to lie. You ever notice that? Nobody need to teach you how to steal. Nobody need to teach you uh, uh, how to be deceptive how to be disobedient. But why do you need to be taught <laughs> how to be right and how to be obedient? You, how, Why do you have to be taught how to walk right when you don't need to be taught how to walk wrong? That's why, this, that's why the, the apostle is saying, uh, uh, I, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. You know, because when in your spirit, there is no good thing. And if you're trying to get answers, I'm sorry, in your flesh, there is no good thing. And if you're trying to find answers in your flesh, you're not going to find it. The only thing, the only thing that you're going to be looking for in your flesh is how to top what it just got away with. It's a good Bible study, folks. And I know I was a little confusing here on 15, 15 through 16, but just surmising it all up. Uh, those things again. Those things that that he came into the understanding of. It's those as this, as those laws was telling him what not to do. He find himself doing it, um, and, and and you know instead of trying to block it off, uh, he find himself doing it, and he's hating it because he knows that it's disobedience. But when he's trying to change, he can't find a way to stay grounded in the ways of God. Because he's looking for answers in his flesh. And within his flesh, there is no good thing. And if there is no good thing, then there is not going to be any answers on how to be good if there is no good thing in your flesh. If you're going to the flesh trying to seek answers of righteousness, it's not going to happen. You can say, okay, I'm, a, I'm going to stop doing these drugs or I'm going to stop smoking. You know, and then you're going to go and try to deceive your, your flesh by getting a patch. You're looking 
for you you're, you're looking for answers in other flesh to curb the flesh if you're looking for answers on how to be righteous you got to go to god you got to quit going to worldly people on how to how to curtail the desires of the flesh. You're trying to go to worldly people, people that ain't even darkened the doorstep of a church to get answers on how to stop being unrighteous. You got to go to God. You if if you're looking for answers on how to be right or how to please God, then you need to go to God. You need to spend some time praying and saying, "Look, I'm having a problem with pornography. I'm having a problem with sex. I'm I'm having a problem uh uh uh, uh with cursing. I'm you know, I'm having a problem with sin, period. I need your deliverance because I can't do this." I need you to deliver me, sweet Jesus Christ. And that's what he does. Amen. That's who he is. He is a deliverer. But instead of us going to God, if you serious about being delivered from your mess, then you quit going to people, which is the flesh, because there is no good answers in flesh. Quit going to people and start going to God for your deliverance if you are delivered. And when he began to strengthen you so that you can walk away from that, quit fraternizing with the thing that he was delivering you from. You trying to test the waters to see how strong you are today. You gonna call the you gonna call the very girl that that the you gonna call the girl or the guy that's got you involved in fornication, and you gonna oh I just want to be your friend. You quit playing, <laughs> quit playing with God first and foremost. But let's go into the end of this, folks. I I don't mean to hold you over. I know this is long enough. Uh, but I like what he says here in nineteen. For the good that I would, I do not. But for the evil that I would not, that I do. When I'm looking to do good, I mess that up. I do bad. But <laughs> but but when I'm looking to to to, he says. But if I'm trying to do bad, it seems to come natural. When I'm trying to do good, it's unnatural. For the good that I would, I do not. But for the evil which I would not, that I do. <laughs> when I'm not trying to do bad, it just comes natural. And every time I try to do good, I end up doing bad. It says, now, if I do that, what I would not, it is no more I that do it, but the sin that dwelleth in me. He says, and, and again, if I do those things that I don't want to do, you know, if I do these things that I don't want to do, if I don't want to sin and I'm doing it, then it's not me. It's the sin that's manipulating me to do these things. Uh, I find, he says, I find in the law that when I would do good, evil is always present. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I find that when I want, I find then in the law that in the law, when I want to do, this is why we are by grace. Because if you look into the law, even though the law is spiritual, remember what we learned earlier in chapter seven, that sin works through the law. Amen. It works through the law. So he said, I find that the problem with the law is that when I want to do good, evil is always present or yeah, hey, it is what it is. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. He says, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into the captivity of, of the law of sin, which is in my members. O rich man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He says, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So, th so, so then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. We're going to sin. And ultimately, that's what he's saying. But he said, but when I, he said, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity into the law of sin, which is in my members. Oh, wretched man I am. And, and you got to understand what he's saying here. He's talking about two natures. He's talking about the, uh, the, the spirit man in him and his flesh man. And they're warring against one another. Amen. And this is why it's important for us to not quench the Holy Ghost, to not quench this, to, to, uh, to not uh, put the fire out, if you will. This is why you have to keep yourself filled with the spirit. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is why you have to, because the moment you stop praying, the moment you stop reading this word, the moment you stop praising God, then that's that flesh that's working to bring you into captivity of sin. It's going to it's going to start winning. 
Even though you are delivered from sin, you are not delivered from any temptations of sin. You are delivered from the control of sin to where you got a choice against sin. But once you, once you, but, but it's, it takes, it takes something from you daily to, st- God to put you here, but it takes commitment from you to stay here. And what does commitment mean? It means I need to stay prayed up. I need to not watch certain programming. I need to not hang around certain people. Anything that can bring me back over here, I need to make sure that I cut that out. Because in me, there is two things warring against one another. There is the law of my mind and there is the law of the flesh. And the flesh is going against the law of my mind. You know, it's trying to bring me back into captivity from where I was delivered from. But I'm not going to let it. I'm a wretched man because every time I set out to do good, it's always some, you ever want to help somebody out, you know, with some money, you know, if they need help or with something to eat, if they need help. And right before you get it, there's something going, there's something in your mind. Right before you give to, to them to help them out, there'll be something in your mind saying, you know what? You might not get that money back. You know what? You really, your family needs something to eat too. What you going to do about that? Every time I try to do good, evil is always present. Amen. You ever go to church, man, I'm talking to you. You ever want, you, you've been out of church for a long time and you go to church and all of a sudden you see women coming in with short skirts. Your eyes begin to try to wonder, you know why there's sin in you. It's trying to bring you back into captivity to where you were delivered from. Same thing. Women, you go to church and you see these fine men. You call, you say that I'm a fine man. I don't want nobody saying the pastor said fine man. Oh yeah. You see women, you're saying to your girlfriends, I see this fine man coming on up in church. And guess what's happening? It's making you look around. Same thing with the dudes. You see these women, short skirts, making you look around, making you focus on them. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's making you want to embrace them. That's sin. And sin will always, it don't matter where you are. You can be in the pool pit. You could be in the congregation. You can be in your prayer closet. And because you got to take your flesh with you wherever you go, that means wherever you wherever you go and whatever you try to do, evil is always present because it dwells in your skin. It's carnal. It dwells in your flesh. Even, so you've been delivered from the power of sin, but not from the temptation. So you got to walk. You got to make sure you not walk in contrary. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I know it's a long Bible study and I don't want to confuse you. I don't want to beat you with the word, but I want to put out here what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying that we got wars going on inside of us. One is trying to bring one is trying to keep us into life and one is trying to bring us back to death. So we can close out the Bible study here. And uh, I just want you, uh, want you folks to to go with me real quick. Um, Romans uh, ten and nine. We talked about this during our last recording. What does it take to be delivered from sin? What does it take to regain control of of who you are? Hmm? What does it take to regain? Uh, what does it, some of you you can't say regain? What does it take to have control of your life? What does it take to be delivered from cigarette smoking, alcohol and drugs, uh, fornication, homosexuality, uh, uh, pornography? What does it take to be delivered from sin? You can't do it. You yourself cannot do it. It takes the Lord Jesus Christ to deliver you from it because he's a deliverer. You're not the deliverer. You are the delivery. <laughs> you are the one who gets delivered, but you're not the one who is able to deliver. Do you understand? It takes Jesus to deliver you. And once he deliver you, he cleans you up and he fortifies you and to, to, to allow you to be able to make the choice. Once he deliver you and he places you over here, 
He strengthens you so you can decide against sin. Amen. But he delivers you so that you can make a good choice. A lot of you, some your sins may feel so good for you to you that you find you're trying to find scripture to justify to stay up in there. This ain't for you if that's the case. Because there needs to be a conviction from you to know that your lifestyle is sinful and it's disobedience against God. You can't try to find scripture to justify. That's what Eve and the serpent did in the garden. They were trying to take the scriptures or they was trying to take the word of God to use it to justify being disobedience against God. You can't justify sin. The only justification of sin is the judgment of God. That's it. That's the only justification of it is the judgment of God. God justifies you as a professional sinner and you're going to die. That's it. Made possible. Sin was your sponsor. We all sin, but that don't mean it has to have power over you. It doesn't have to have control over you. And don't kid yourself. You cannot, you cannot have control of your life until you give your life to Christ so that he can clean you up and give it back to you, and you can decide against sin. That's how it has to work. You got to make the choice. Otherwise, sin has been reigning in your mortal bodies. Now you know that just because you saved, you're still going to have temptations. That's what he tells us. But a lot of us is no longer temptations. It's just the lifestyle of sin. Temptations are those that are saved that are being tempted of the enemy. But for others that have not been saved, it's a lifestyle. This is for you to be delivered. You want to be delivered and set free. You want to be cleaned up. You want to know what it's like to praise God and have him receive your praise. You want to know what it's like to walk with God and to talk with God. You want to know what it's like to wake up with a clear conscience, to know that when you, if, if something happened as you start your day, that if you should die to know that you're going to spend the rest of your life with God, you want to know what that's like, then you do this. You give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it takes. You got to give your life to Christ. You cannot stop doing those things that you do unless you got Christ with you. He has to be the one to deliver you from the captivity of it, clean you up and free you and fortify you so that from this point on, you can make the decision against sin. But you can't. You can only stop sin for the day. You can, you can only put sin on pause. If you haven't given your life over to Christ, all you're doing is pause and sin so that when you press the play button, it's going gonna, it's gonna to not only go forward, but it's going to grab what it already missed and put that on top of going forward. You, ain't, you, you can't stop sin. The only one that can is the Lord Jesus Christ. Once he strengthens you, then you have the power to, to stop it. So if you're ready to embrace Christ Jesus, this is your time. This is how we do it. And this is what we do. Romans 10 and 9. Amen. Romans 10 and 9. Uh, let's start with verse 8. But what saith? The word is near unto you. The same word that I'm giving you, I'm putting it at you. So now it's right here at you. The word, it's near. It's nigh. He says, um, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It don't cost you no money. You don't have to go into a booth and tell and, and tell a priest about what you did, and he, he says, I'll give you seven helmets. It don't take all that. What it takes is for you to confess the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe in your heart and confess him from your mouth. Thou shalt be saved. This gospel. Now, if you're ready to do this, because he, he is real. This is not cliche. This thing is real. He'll deliver you from every sin you can think of. Every sin that has placed you into captivity. Everything that you've not been able to do. You haven't been able to stop smoking. You can't stop drinking. You can't stop lying. You can't stop letting your thoughts run rampant. Whatever it is that you failed to do, 
He is able to do it for you. Amen. So if you're ready, say this with me. You say, God, I come to you just as I am. You know my, you know my sins, God. You know where I've been. You know what I've been guilty of. God, I ask you in the name of Jesus right now to deliver me from my sin. Wash me up and clean me out from this day forward. You say, God, I believe that Jesus is your son and that you sent your son here to heaven. Here from heaven, God. You sent your son from heaven down to earth. And God, I believe that your son gave his life, allowed men to take his life. But Father, on the third day of his death, you resurrected him from the dead. And soon after, ascended him up into heaven. Now you call on Jesus. You said, Jesus, I call on you right now to deliver me from my sin, to release me from the death of death. Wash me up and clean me out from this day forward. My life is your life. In Jesus' name, if you believed it and you confessed it, then you've been saved. Amen. Only thing you need to do from this point on is have a man of God baptize you. You want to make sure that you're baptized. But praise God, you've been saved. Again, the only thing that you need to do is have a man of God baptize you. Baptism is ceremonial. It's going to represent the burying of you. Uh, it represents us being buried in the Lord Jesus Christ and being resurrected. Amen. Uh, once we go into the water and rise from the water, it represents the old man going down and a new man coming up. I had a fantastic time. I hope you enjoyed the Bible study. Um, I'm noticing within the camera that I'm getting hit. <laughs> My wife is going to trip because it's getting a whole shot. Normally, we try to keep some things out. But uh, I've, I've just now noticing in the camera, I've been so in tuned in this in, in the Bible study that I didn't know that it was out of out of focus. But hopefully, folks, that you guys got the gist of this Bible study. Hopefully you focused on the message and not the picture until we meet again. I love you and I hope you receive from this Bible study. Amen. Um, don't forget, folks. Uh, if make sure that you're donating, make sure that you're giving it to families, make sure if it's in your power to give that you're blessing families that don't have. Um, the, if you want to give to this ministry, you we have a donation page on our website. Uh, you can give to that. Remember, we don't use your money to take care of this ministry. This ministry is self-sustaining. We would like to help other families. If you can help us help them, fantastic if not make sure you help them amen until we meet again peace be upon you my brothers and sisters in the mighty name of the lord jesus christ amen and amen i love you